Are permanent fillers without risk? Of course they're with risk because they are long lasting. But we use breast implants and we've seen recently in Europe and around the world the chaos that has ensued by a poor quality implant. And it is, it is very important that when we look at long lasting products, and we should look at all products, that we ensure that we're using a very safe and a very reputable product that's been well tested. But we use all of these products. As a plastic surgeon, I use these products week in and week out. And they do have risks. But I mitigate those risks by safe practice and make sure that I'm using the safest products that are available. That doesn't mean I don't do these procedures. Permanent fillers exist in all aspects of medicine. We use hip and knee prostheses. We use facial implants. We use cements in orthopedics and dentistry. We use cardiac stents. The benefit of these, of these procedures far outweigh the risks, but they have significant risks. Acrimid should be considered in a similar manner. It has the same potential risk, but also the significant benefits. We need to ensure that when you use a product like Acrimid that's long lasting, that you pay good attention to good medical principles and ensure that you provide a safe treatment. It's not a Cavalier injectable. I've had a lot of discussions with a company about removing Aquamid from this injectable market because it's not an, an injectable, as we said. It's an implant that happens to come in a syringe. So our patients are asking for something that's longer lasting. They like less maintenance, few times they have to go in for needle sticks, less overall costs. They don't want to see the physician all the time. Well, many of the physicians do want something more temporary that's easy to inject with less worries and don't mind the visits. But their expectations, they want a procedure that's easy with no pain, reliable, minimal or no downtime, and they do want longevity. So we want a product that's available, it's malleable, early results, very few AEs, and longevity is important. Now, the problem with uh, the uh, polyacrylamides is that uh, in the U.S. today, they, they want to lump all HAs together, and all HAs are not the same. Well, neither are all polyacrylamides the same. And so many of the complications are written up as polyacrylamide complications, but they are not due to Aquamid. The great majority are due to amazing gel in the breasts from China. I'm going to go through this in a minute, or bioalchemid. People get very mixed up with the name. I once gave a lecture on Aquamid, and the first question was, how long have you used bioalchemid? And so what happens is that uh, people are mixed up with the name and with the product, and all hydrogels are not the same. For instance, uh, uh, the bioalchemid is also called Perform, is composed of polymers of alchemide units. Evolution, which is composed of polyvinyl microspheres, and it is suspended in an uh, acrylamide polymer. Aquamid, on the other hand, is composed solely of cross-linked polyacrylamide. So chemically, they're not the same. There are other polyacrylamides which appeared in the early 90s, uh, invented and patented in the Ukraine, and a number of very similar and maybe the same preparations emerged, formacryl, bioformacryl, cosmogel, argiform in Russia, amazing gel in China, and many of these products have changed their names over the years, so you're not sure which one it is. So why is this important? Because the rate and severity of the complications of the other polyacrylamides differs greatly from the experience with Aquamid. And a recent comprehensive world literature review on the subject shows that there is a negative perception of these polyacrylamides, and it's based on the serious adverse events with these products, which are injected as a bolus with large volume, like amazing gel in the breasts in China. There's a lot of articles on that. As an um, assistant editor of the Journal of Dermatologic Surgery, I recently received an article 
just saying polyacrylamide with some horrendous complications, and of course it was not Aquamid. So we made them actually use the name, which you know the FDA only wants us to use the generic name, but it's incorrect here because they aren't the same product. So the quality of the published studies is generally very poor for the other polyacrylamides compared to Aquamid. Uh, and the incidence of adverse events is much lower with Acromid because it's injected as thin strands and it interacts with the tissue. It is the only polyacrylamide that is uh, approach, uh, that is uh, being um, uh, going through the FDA now in the U.S. market, the uh, clinical trial uh, being finished a while ago. The polyacrylamides are like sponges. And they have a difference in their pore structure. And the pore structure is related to the ratio of acrylamide monomer and crosslinker, the catalyst, and the method of polymerization. In the next few slides, I'm going to show you some electron microscopy images of three polyacrylamides so that you can see the differences in their morphology. And the, this different geometry of this structure shows why Aquamid allows the ingrowth of cells while the others don't allow this ingrowth and become encapsulated. So this is Aquamid, uh, and this is a cryo-frozen fractured Aquamid, and you can see that uh, the pore structure is pretty regular. Uh, the, what, the, uh, on your right, it's um, higher magnification. Uh, it's pretty regular, and uh, it isn't that small, so it allows ingrowth of the fibrous tissue. This is bioalchemid. You can see that the pores are much smaller, but it is, um, it is uh, uneven, and the size of the pores uh, are not even. It's really very chaotic. And this is amazing gel. It's even more chaotic, and, um, and these things tend to stay as uh, boluses, and uh, uh, the fibrous tissue cannot uh, get into the tissue. There's very few or no cases of allergy or hypersensitivity or fibrosis and inflammatory and in granulomas have been reported with Acromid. Similar to oral fillers, the adverse events occur at the time of injection and they can be, they're usually transient. They're local, they resolve spontaneously. Ad adverse events do include some redness and bruising and swelling like, like oral fillers, hematoma formation from a needle injection, itching and some pain. As with all transcontinuous injections, the major concern is the transport of bacteria through the skin into the site of injection. And therefore, bacterial contamination of the product is the single most important cause for early and late adverse events. So we have to minimize the risks of complications by careful patient selection, uh, patients who have very poor hygiene, patients who have very poor dental hygiene, uh, patients who have recurrent um, skin infections are probably not an ideal candidate for, for Aquamid or, the, or for any other facial implant. Careful selection of indications. Make sure that, that it's, it's a good indication for, the, for a long-term pro, uh, product. It cannot be emphasized more, and Gary and Rhoda have emphasized this, about sterile injection technique. Because like with all implants, whether it's a breast implant or a chin implant or a facial implant, the single time that that implant is at risk is at the time of implantation. That's the greatest risk to, to that implant. So it's very, and it's very important to adhere to post-treatment instructions. As we've heard previously, there was the complication rate um, recorded for Acromid is less than one in a thousand. 